In this video, we'll show you how the Septuagint demonstrates early authorship of Daniel. Reminder to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell to stay up to date as new videos come out. In part 5, we scrutinized the critics' argument that Daniel didn't exist because Syriac didn't mention him in his work. We saw that Josephus wasn't silent, Jesus wasn't silent, 1 Maccabees wasn't silent, Ezekiel wasn't silent by referring to him five times in his book, and also made note that the book of Daniel is found in the Dead Sea Scroll collection dating to the 2nd century BC. Out of these, there are eight scrolls currently found that contain the following verses from Daniel. But when you see these laid out, that the only chapter that doesn't have any part of it contained in the scrolls is chapter 12. The catch here is that the three additions, as they are called, to Daniel are not found in any of these scrolls. So in light of the languages, we see that these additions are not part of the original work Thus, they are additions inserted in by a later translator. Using the critics' timeline, they say that the final form of Daniel wasn't composed until 165 during the Maccabean Revolt. They don't go beyond this point because they say that the rest of the descriptions about Antiochus in Daniel 11 are in error, so the anonymous author wasn't able to recall the events any longer so that's their cutoff point to dating the book. We would say that those verses are not in error, but were casted past the events of Antiochus to a future evil tyrant similar to him. This is the viewpoint that Jesus held because of his Daniel citations in the Olivet Discourse. Now, adding to this time period, we see that 1 Maccabees was composed in about 134 BC. This leaves a 30-year window for the completed form of Daniel to be popularized and viewed as canonical. The three editions were composed around 100 BC, but what this means is that the Septuagint translation of Daniel had to be completed by this point as well for these three editions to be inserted in a little bit later. So, there is only 50 years for the original to be written, popularized, and elevated to the same canonical level as Isaiah, Jeremiah, or any other prophet. But also, it has to be hustled down to Alexandria, Egypt to be translated into Greek, with three new editions getting inserted in not too much later. Doesn't that seem like a lot for to happen in such a short period of time? But let's just roll with that little narrative. According to the critic, all the Hebrew scriptures were composed by the 5th century BC other than Daniel. The translation of the Old Testament into Greek began in 286 BC after Ptolemy Philadelphus, Pharaoh of Egypt, requested for the Jewish scriptures to be added to the Alexandrian Library by 70 or 72 Jewish scribes, which is why it's called the Septuagint. But this process went on for at least 180 years because Daniel, according to the critic, doesn't get written or finalized until 165 and within the next 60 years it's elevated to be included in the Hebrew scriptures as the only book recorded from this period 300 years after Malachi. Now with this 50 year gap between the original Daniel being completed in Hebrew and Aramaic and then translated into Greek you would expect that the translation would be smooth or at least correct, right? But that's not what happened. Daniel 3 listed seven titles of officials that were summoned by Nebuchadnezzar written in Aramaic. But when these got translated into Greek, scholar John Walvoord said that the Septuagint versions are hopelessly inexact and are merely guesswork in their rendering of counselor, treasurer, law officer, magistrate, and police chief. This is backed up by scholar Kenneth A. Kitchen who said, if the first important Greek translation of Daniel was made sometime within 100 BC to 100 AD, roughly speaking, and the translator could not, or took no trouble to, reproduce the proper meanings of these terms, then one conclusion imposes itself. 
their meaning was already lost and forgotten, or at least drastically changed long before he set to work. Both scholars are saying that the translators are making serious mistakes. They're either really lazy, which is unlikely, you know, because they are hired by the king of Egypt to do this task, or they're ignorant of how to translate these words. This isn't a one-person task, so you're talking about the best educated Jewish scribes doing this, but they can't get these titles translated correctly. So how do you make sense of this? Well, Kitchen continues on this thought, saying, Now if Daniel, in particular the Aramaic chapters of 2 through 7, was wholly a product of 165 BC, then a century or so in a continuous tradition is surely embarrassingly inadequate as a sufficient interval for that loss or change of meaning to occur by Near Eastern standards. So he notes, this would be really poor scholarship at play to be entered into the Alexandrian Library. He goes on saying, Therefore, it is desirable on this ground to seek the original of such verses, and hence of the narratives of which they are an integral part, much earlier than this date, preferably within memory of the Persian rule from 539 to 280 BC, allowing about 50 years lapse from the fall of Persia to Macedonia. What Kitchen just said is that the Aramaic section in Daniel, chapters 2 through 7, are better dated to the Persian period because of these types of translation mistakes. They wouldn't have occurred if the whole book was written only 60 years or so before it was translated into Greek. So if you're really going to go fishing on this authorship debate, you will see that there are critics who will, will allow for Daniel 1 through 6, and sometimes chapter 7, to be dated before 165 and into the 3rd century BC. But chapter 7 is held pretty close to the chest because it's the transition point in the book when the prophecies st start storming in, and especially the ones related to Antiochus. So what this means is that some critics take a multiple authorship view to Daniel, but would maintain that the last six chapters weren't written until 165 because that anonymous author was just recalling recent events and just portraying them as prophecies to encourage local Jews to in their oppression. But here's why this simply does not work. Josephus said in Against Appion, For we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another, as the Greeks have, but only 22 books which contain the records of all the past times. He says 22 instead of 24 books because Ruth would have been included with Judges and Lamentations with Jeremiah. But he's obviously including Daniel as part of the canon, especially in light of the fact that he basically copied the entire book of Daniel into his Antiquity of the Jews and said that the book was handed to Alexander the Great so to stop him from looting the temple. This is confirmed as he says, which are justly believed to be divine, and of them five belong to Moses, which contain his laws and the traditions of the origin of mankind till his death. This interval of time was little short of 3,000 years. So you basically got the Torah in that statement. Then he says, but as to the time from the death of Moses, till the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, who reigned after Xerxes, the prophets who were after Moses wrote down what was done in their times in 13 books. The remaining four books contain hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. So, for the third time, Josephus disagrees with the critical view. He says Daniel and the rest of Jewish scriptures was written before Artaxerxes' reign ended in 425 BC. And he justifies this by saying that it is true our history hath been written since Artaxerxes very particularly, but hath not been esteemed of the like authority with the former by our forefathers, because there hath not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. What Josephus is saying is that since 425, there haven't been any new prophets from that point up until his day.
Now look at how serious he is about this by his closing statement that says, and how firmly we have given credit to these books of our own nation is evident by what we do. For doing or during so many ages as have already passed, no one has been so bold as to either add anything to them, to take anything from them, or to make any change in them. He says, no one is so bold or really stupid to change the Hebrew scriptures. So adding a new book like Daniel in the late second century BC, according to the critics, simply did not happen. Josephus emphasized the seriousness of the Hebrew scriptures by saying, but it is become natural to all Jews immediately and from their very birth to esteem these books to contain divine doctrines and to persist in them and if occasion be willingly to die for them. Josephus is 100% against the critical view. So to the critic, is Josephus telling the truth? Is he lying? Or is he that bad of a historian to be fooled by your anonymous forger that set this whole thing in motion? Now is there anyone else that can back up this view that no prophets had come after 425 BC up until their day? Yes, there is. The writer of 1 Maccabees. He says, And he, Judas Maccabeus, chose blameless priests, such as had pleasure in the law. And they cleansed the holy place, and bare out the stones of defilement into an unclean place. And they took counsel concerning the altar of burnt offerings, which had been profaned, what they should do with it. Now, because Antiochus defiled the altar by sacrificing a pig on it to Zeus, the Jews had to decide what to do with the altar because it could no longer stay in the temple. He continues saying, And there came into their mind a good counsel that they should pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them because the Gentiles had defiled it, and they pulled down the altar, and laid up the stones in the mountain of the house in a convenient place. So the priests move the altar out of the temple because they don't know how to handle the situation. So why are they confused? They're the priests. The religious leaders even got a high priest who can go into the Holy of Holies. So what's the problem? The rest of the verse explains why. Until there should come a prophet to give an answer concerning them. The point and statement here is that there are currently no prophets amongst them at this time. And here's the kicker. Six verses later, the author gives us the date of this event at 165 BC. Remember, critics say that Daniel was finalized in 165 BC, but 1 Maccabees just declared that there are no prophets amongst them in 165 BC. So, I guess the Daniel forgery isn't quite as popular as one would make it at this point, or maybe the leadership just doesn't know about it. Well, maybe it needs just more years for the leadership to catch on to it. Okay, well let's just work off all those thoughts. Because five chapters later it says, So there was great distress in Israel, such as had not been seen since the time that the prophets ceased to appear among them. Now, this is dated to 161 BC, four years after the critical view. So four years have gone by, and nobody has heard about any new prophet or this new book that has been concocted to give them hope in their struggle with Antiochus. But I guess the persecution isn't quite over yet, so how about a little bit later? The Jews and their priests have resolved that Simon should be their leader and high priest forever until a trustworthy prophet should arise. And this is dated to 141 BC. So 24 years after the critics say that the book was finalized and still Jewish leaders are saying there are no prophets amongst them. See how the critical view crumbles under this type of scrutiny? Critics would have to maintain that the whole book of 1 Maccabees is part of the grand conspiracy as well. Because the writer grouped Daniel and his three friends with the likes of Abraham, Joshua, David, and Elijah 
and place them in the exile period in the 6th century BC because chapter 2 is dated to 167 BC, two years before the critical date. Fine, they're all lying. That's what they do to make their God seem real. Really? If your thinking is anywhere near that line, then you have crossed over to the irrational, conspiratorial side that you likely mock flat earthers for having. Now, outside of the historical impossibility of the critical view, let me tell you why the book would have never been canonized if the book was composed in the manner that critics say. Canonization or acceptance of a prophet has to pass a test from the Torah. When a prophet speaks in the Lord's name and the message does not come true or is not fulfilled, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. So if Daniel is an heir after the events of 165 with Antiochus, then the book would have never been placed in the Hebrew canon. Remember, Josephus says the Jews take their scriptures really seriously. They would have never inserted a book that was so obviously forged or written and filled with errors. But it is in there because the book was written in the 6th century BC and the prophecies were casted and given 400 years in advance. I understand the implications of what that means. It means that the God of the Bible and of Israel and of the Christians is real because there is no naturalistic way to explain them away. And then the rest of the implications of what that means to you personally now kicks in. But for right now, I just hope that you're seeing that the critical view cannot stand up to scrutiny. The critics who promote these views are giving you misinformation. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at JustScripture.org. In the meantime, stay salty.